All right, we should be live. How's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, research, election writer. It is Wednesday, July 10th, 2019, and we are live. So we should be on uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and on YouTube also at Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. All right, hope everybody's doing all right today. Okay, so I wanted to talk about this topic. I've dealt with this in the past um, a number of times. And I, I saw an article from July 8th, 2019 from blackamericaweb.com um, that was picked up from the Associated Press. So a number of different outlets picked up this article. Uh, also, we'll do a, a quick preview of uh, our online course that uh, we're doing tonight, uh, 8 p.m. Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, so that's um, an online course I'm teaching at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today, and uh, it, it, it will be class number four. So we'll post the information here so you can register for that. As soon as you register, you can watch um, the first three courses uh, also. OK. All right. So uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com had an article dealing with uh, schools still struggling with how to teach about slavery. Schools still struggling with how to teach about slavery. And we have seen stories uh, over the past few months dealing with mock slave auctions, dealing with uh, reenactments of slavery that are being used in the schools to uh, teach the history of slavery. And educational experts talk about how this is, uh, how this can psychologically, psychologically damage students. This should not be used, uh, but also You've heard me talk about the online study. I mean, you've heard me talk about the 52 page study from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery, that documents how the history of slavery in this country is not being properly taught in the schools. Okay. And this has a uh, wide ranging negative impact, uh, especially as uh, students matriculate through. Uh, school and become adults. OK, uh, so this is the 52 page study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And then the article from the Associated Press, this study is referenced. You can uh, download it from SPLCenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLCenter.org. And it's called uh, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. OK. All right. So let me and uh, let me share this here on uh, my personal page also everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page invite your friends to tune in as well okay so if we look at the uh, article from uh, blackamericaweb.com and can everybody hear me okay if we look at the article from blackamericaweb.com from the Associated Press this is uh, from July 8th 2019 uh, they talk about um, a 10 year old uh, African-American boy named Nico, uh, Nico. And this case took place in 2011. And his mother, her name is Anika Burton, B-U-R-T-O-N. Okay. And she talked about a, uh, incident that happened, uh, in his class and it dealt with a, uh, reenactment dealing with, uh, slavery. And, he told his mother, quote, they made me a slave today. They made me a slave today. All right. Uh, and his mother still remembers when her 10 year old son, Nico, recounted his experience to his grandfather after school one day. So this took place in 2011, this this incident. But uh, Anika Burton believes the classroom exercise in which uh, Nico's classmates were encouraged to examine and pretend to bid on each other during a history lesson continues to affect his life, even now as an 18 year old high school graduate. Okay, so his um, his mother 
uh, said, quote, he tries to act like, to act like it did. It did not bother him. But I really think it changed him. OK. Um, and they live in uh, Ohio. It's it's those memories that leave her shaking her head years later as reports about mock slave auctions continue to emerge reminders that schools are still struggling with how to teach about slavery and its impacts. And when you read the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center and I um, incorporate some of the information from the study in the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. When you read this 52 page study, they talk about how dozens of teachers um, in the survey that they did of 1700 social studies teachers, dozens of teachers surveyed reported simulations as their uh, favorite lessons when teaching about slavery, according to the report. Though its authors, the authors of the report and others, said such reenactments do more harm than good. And this is true. We saw this uh, when it came to the uh, state of New Jersey, okay? Uh, we'll go to that in, um, we'll, we'll talk about that some as well, because in the state of New Jersey, you had, I'm sorry, in the state of New York, in the state of New York, uh, Attorney General Letitia James investigated a incident from May dealing with a mock slave auction at the, uh, at a private school called Chapel School in Winchester County. And this uh, and they found that the uh, that this mock slave auction um, negatively impacted the children. OK, NBC News reported on this. Uh, I, I talked about this a few times. OK. All right. So so we'll talk about that as well. How's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast uh, on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, OK, we got Robbie, Monica, Naji, Zuri, just a few people watching on uh on Facebook, man, we have people watching on our YouTube channel also. Uh, Intrinsic, uh, Q Hefner, uh, Ahmed, just a few of the people watching as well. Okay. We'll post a link also so you can register for um, our online course also because class number four is uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we do the class on Wednesdays. So we'll post this link uh, as well. As soon as you register, you can watch the first three courses. And also uh, there's about uh, 36 hours of bonus content as well that you can watch uh, when you get a chance. All right, so let's continue here. Now, one of the things they talk about in this article is that there are no national standards for uh, teaching the history of slavery. OK, and that's one of the problems. That's one of the things uh, this uh, talked about in the uh, in the study as well. OK, so. Uh, there are no national standards on how to teach about slavery, although it is often recommended as a topic in uh, curriculum at the state and local levels, according to Lawrence Pasca, executive director of the National Council for the Social Studies. Now, the guidance leaves uh specific lessons up to schools and teachers who on several occasions have caused offense with attempts to bring history to life. Now, an investigation by New York Attorney General Letitia James, who is African-American, by the way, African-American sister, uh, found in May of 2019 that a mock slave auction uh, that singled out black students at the private chapel school in Westchester County had a profoundly negative effect on all of the students of, involved, a profoundly negative effect on all of the students uh, involved. Uh, Letitia, Attorney General Letitia James uh, said, quote, lessons designed to separate children on the basis of race have no place in New York classrooms or in classrooms throughout the country, end quote, she said. And uh, let me see something here. I had the uh, article dealing with uh, dealing with her findings as well. That was just in the past. Uh, let's see, what's this? Uh, July. That was probably in June, I think it was. There was an article dealing with um, 
dealing with her findings. So we'll try to pull that up uh, also. Okay. Uh, let's continue. Now, the, the teacher was fired. The teacher's name was uh, Rebecca Antonozzi. All right. Um, I, I shared information dealing with her. There was an interview that um, there was an interview that uh, uh, she did with a local news outlet and talked about how, uh, you know, it wasn't her intention to uh, harm the children or anything like that. Uh, she was teaching about the uh, history of slavery. And one of the, she said one of the students asked her, you know, how could how could uh, they have been forced to work? How can they how could they have been forced into slavery? So she, you know, uh, they they say, can you show us? Can you explain it to us? And um, she had some of the students to um, uh, line up. And the she was acting out and, you know, doing some type of mock slave auction as a teaching tool. OK, when you actually read this study, it tells you don't do slave reenactments, things like that. Now, one of the problems is, is that this study is not required reading for teachers. This is one of the problems. OK, is not required reading for teachers. And I, I think it should be because in these cases where I read about these slave lessons go, gone wrong, if they had just um, read the study, uh, they would know don't do that. And many of these people would still have their jobs today. OK, uh, so I, I just find it interesting that a lot of uh, teachers don't know about the study. It should be and it should be required by the school districts. It should be required that the principal should make it uh, a requirement that um, they that, that the teachers have to read this study. OK, and it could cause them a whole lot of embarrassment. It can, it can save them from a whole lot of embarrassment as well. All right. Let me try to. Uh, I was trying to pull up the update to this. Uh, story. Let me see here. I just have to um, pull up uh, the chapel school because there's an update uh, dealing with the findings of the investigation uh, from uh, the state's attorney general. OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll pull up that article also. All right, let's continue here. All right, so other recent examples include a, okay, here we go, we've got it. Other recent examples um, include an escaping slavery game. It was a board game that gave North Carolina fourth graders a freedom punch card that read, quote, if your group runs into trouble four times, you will be you will be severely punished and sent back to the plantation to work as a slave, end quote. Families also criticized a Virginia obstacle course intended to replicate the Underground Railroad navigated by third, fourth and fifth graders pretending to be runaway slaves. OK, so these are all. So so escaping slavery is a board game that has been used in a number of schools. All right. There was uh, there was an article uh, dealing with this. There was a local news outlet that um, I, I first saw this story and this was in. Let's see. Yeah, New Hanover School Board apologizes for monopoly like slave game. NAACP responds. This was um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. The New Hanover County Board of Education apologized for a controversial uh, monopoly like game used to teach slavery to fourth grade students at a Wilmington elementary school. Now, Wilmington, North Carolina, that's where that's where the Wilmington massacre took place in 1898. Um, and you had a you, you you had a grandmother who talked about this game. Actually, uh, there was another article that I saw dealing with this. Um, let's see here. If he apologizes, 
So the name of the game was called, um, it was an underground railroad game called Escaping Slavery. So in the underground railroad game called Escaping Slavery, teachers gave students a freedom punch card, a freedom punch card that reads, quote, if your group runs into trouble four times, you will be severely punished and sent back to the plantation as a as uh, as uh, to work as a slave. Now, uh, you had a, a grandmother whose granddaughter was in that class. OK. And the grandmother uh, uh, said that her granddaughter told her that the teacher told students to write their slave name on the back of the of the card that they were given. Quote, after the four punches, uh, uh, were they going to hang them? The grandmother asked, were they going to kill them? What else was going to go on after this? OK, you're teaching these kids uh, a slave plantation. All right. So this was this is a board game. Check this out. This is a board game designed to teach them about the history of slavery. All right. Now, the school did not create this board game, which means it, it was a company that produces this board game and sells it to schools. OK, so so check out this article from. Uh, this was one of the first ones about this. This was from March 11th, 2019. Uh, this is from WECT.com, WECT.com. New Hanover School Board apologizes for a monopoly like slavery game. OK, NAACP uh, responds. And the, with the NAACP um, there in the. Uh, uh, Wilmington or in the Wilmington area, uh, North Carolina area, in a news release, um, the new Hanover County NAACP commended the school board for its quick response, but also lamented the fact that the game was ever played. The, the, the game is in bad. The, I mean, this I before this article that I before this article which came out in March of 2019, I did not know this game existed. OK. Well, I think this was the second article. I found out about it from the from the uh, from the first article because there was a video of um, there was a video of the grandmother. OK, yeah. So the first article was from March 8th, 2019. Monopoly like slave game played by fourth grade in C North Carolina class outrageous grandmother. OK, and that was the first article I saw about this. And I didn't notice this game existed but this game is manufactured by a company and sold to schools okay and and it's so it, the educational website that sold this game is called teachers pay teachers teachers pay teachers and a statement emailed to wect connington elementary school principal graham elmore wrote that fourth grade social studies teachers used the monopoly light game in january of 2019 and it was a, obtained from the educational website teachers pay teachers quote the purpose was to play a role role r-o-l-e to increase interest and enthusiasm for historical events the teachers wanted to share how the people communicated and worked for change and equality in their communities okay end quote the assignment copyrighted by wise guys teachers pay teachers uh website um it, it, it goes on to say quote the activities by no means intended to disregard the fact that slavery was an inhumane and unnecessary period for so many people end quote according to the product description the board game is part of a larger activity teachers have used for the past two years according to um uh elmore the principal confirmed a card in the game references going back to the plantation but there was quote no emphasis on picking any names end quote according to a spokesperson the whole ideal is just ridiculous the whole the whole ideal is just bad and this and things like this traumatize uh african-american students all right okay so uh let's go back to the article from the associated press and in, in, in black america web this is from july 8th 2019. all right how's everybody doing who we have here uh, i'm flipping through different screens uh we have michelle manos uh malik okay all right just a few people watching how's everybody doing that's on uh, facebook on youtube we've got uh uh 
copper, intrinsic, uh, luscious. Okay, those on uh, YouTube. All right, let's continue. Let's go back to the uh, article from the Associated Press. So uh, Attorney General Letitia James for the state of New York said lessons designed to separate children on the basis of race have no place in New York classrooms or in classrooms throughout the country, she said. Now, uh, in the study Teaching Hard History of American Slavery by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, they, they, they state, quote, teaching about slavery is hard. This was summarized in the 2008 report from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which surveyed more than 1,700 social studies teachers and analyzed textbooks. Quote, no national consensus exists on how to teach about slavery, and there is little leadership. Uh, it is time to change this state of affairs, end quote. So there have to, there have to be national standards on how to teach the history of slavery. OK, this study is a good start. I'm not saying the study is 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 totally complete, but this study is a lot better than what's taking place right now. OK, uh, you can download it from the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLCenter.org. You know, I'm speaking at the uh, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that's uh, July, Friday, July 19th through Sunday, July 21st. OK, and uh, teachers uh, was uh, parents that homeschool your children. This is something that you can download to incorporate into uh, your teachings. All right. But we also have to understand that this deals with politics as well. National standards for teaching the history of slavery is going to come from the Department of Education. The secretary of education is nominated by a president and the secretary of education is then confirmed by by the US Senate so Betsy DeVos who is one of the dumbest women you would ever want to meet who has no business being the secretary of education okay she was nominated by Donald Trump one of the things she has done is rolled back the the Obama era restrictions on for-profit colleges because under President Obama, he shut down a lot of for-profit colleges like ITT Tech, because there were a lot of for-profit, a lot of for-profit colleges who were disproportionately targeting African Americans and Hispanics, getting them to take out large uh, student loans. Then they will go through the go through the program, go through the course, and not be properly placed in the jobs that had anything to do with the training they got, and now they're stuck with these huge loans. And many of them defaulted on the loans. OK. And it was also uh, uh, under the Obama administration that uh, President Obama implemented. He put in place uh, student loan forgiveness for people who were victims of for profit colleges, things like this. And Betsy DeVos delayed the, the implementation of that forgiveness plan so much so that she was sued by a number of states attorney generals. But who nominated Betsy DeVos? It was Donald Trump. Um, well, Donald Trump ran a fake university called Trump University that was a for-profit college also. And it was so fake that he was sued by the attorney general in the state of New York and ended up selling out of court. Uh, it was $24 million uh, settlement plus a $1 million fine. And who did, who did Donald Trump nominate as secretary of education? Betsy DeVos, who has turned back the restrictions on for-profit colleges. I wonder why. So this all also ties into politics and how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Politics is the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Politics uh, impacts every aspect of our life. So even if you homeschool your children, right, uh, the second, there's still some standards that you have to even meet with homeschooling. Otherwise, when your children go to college, colleges, all the colleges are, are um, under the auspices and control of the Department of Education. When they go to college, they're going to be behind. So even though I'm an advocate for homeschooling, I also understand that all parents are not going to be able to 100 percent solely homeschool their children. OK, and they need some type of resources as well. All right. So let's continue. 
and those in the Chicago area, I'll be in Chicago uh, Saturday, July 13th for the uh, Black Agenda Tour. I interviewed uh, Michi X and Jice Johnson today. Um, so I'll be on the panel. I'll be speaking there along with David Banner, uh, hip hop artist and actor David Banner, Michi X, Jice Johnson, Cassiopeia of the Black Mall. Uh, so visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. The information is there. Visit uh, the Black Agenda on Tour.com. Also, the Black Agenda on Tour.com. Okay, let's continue here. And okay, here we go. All right, but this all ties into understanding politics as well. Okay, so uh, at the Chapel School, the fifth grade, uh, the Chapel School in. Um, in New York, Bronxville, New York. OK, the chapel school is a private uh, school. The fifth grade teacher who led the mock auction in, in March of uh, 2019 was fired. Her name was Rebecca Antonosi. And th there's a good article from uh, Vox.com that talks about this. American schools can't figure out how to teach kids about slavery. This is from uh, March 13th, 2019. American schools can't figure out how to teach uh, kids about slavery. So the school agreed to uh, hire a, a, a diversity officer and, and change the discipline practices after parents complained that African-American students were lined up against a wall wearing imaginary shackles and sold to their white peers. This was a mock auction slave reenactment. Now, her attorney disputes this account. Um, she uh, talked about how it transpired in seeing the actual interview with her. I don't think she had, I don't think she intended to harm the children. There have been a number of parents who have come out, basically about 50 parents and some of them African-Americans who have come out in support of her and say, you know, um, uh, she's not that type of person to try to hurt the children. All right. However, if she had read this study here, she would still have her job today because it tells you in here, don't do slavery enactments. All right. If she had read this study, she would still have her job. If the, if the school she was at um, made it mandatory that the uh, teachers read that study, she would still have her job today. So personally, if, if it, it's to me, it sounds like she was poorly trained. It sounds like she was poorly trained, which we see consistently across the country. So. If I was her, I would counter sue and say, hey, wait a second. I wasn't even trained properly to be able to teach this subject matter. Now, Nicole Days, D-A-Y-E-S, complained about a similar experience in her son's fourth grade class in upstate New York's Watertown City School District in May of 2019 after he described to her after he described it to her. OK, now uh, the mother, Nicole Days, uh, said, quote, his whole demeanor changed. It was kind of somber and uncomfortable. It looked uh, it, it took me a while to really comprehend what he was saying to me, end quote. So the district said in a statement, the teacher had been placed on administrative leave. Superintendent Patricia Labar said the district has since sought expert guidance on diversity, inclusion and equity as it reviews its policies and programs. Now, New York's uh, social studies curriculum in, in, uh, is typical in that it outlines grade level concepts. It outlines, outlines grade level concepts. Fourth grade students, quote, will examine life as a slave in New York State, end quote, for example, but does not provide specific lessons. So. The, the, the teachers are not being properly trained and they're not given proper resources on how to teach the history of slavery. Ill-conceived lessons happen enough that advocates like Teaching Tolerance, a project of the Southern Poverty Law Center, offer lesson plans with, with suggestions. Hold on, the screen is jumping around. OK, uh, offer lesson plans with suggestions of text and discussion. Teaching Tolerance plans to publish a framework for teaching about slavery in grades kindergarten through fifth grade in August of 2019, which is much needed. All right. Now, Maria uh, Sapon Shevin, S-H-E-V-I-N, um, who's a professor 
of inclusive education at Syracuse University said, quote, it's never OK to recreate painful, oppressive events, even in the name of education. All right. It's never OK to recreate painful, oppressive events, even in the name of education. All right. This is what she said. Um, and she said teachers risk harming their students sense of belonging, safety and inclusion. She said, quote, one would never simulate an Indian massacre or having Jews march into the ovens, end quote. This is a direct quote from what she said. Don't get mad at me. OK, this is this is a direct quote from her. But she's correct, because when you see this, first of all, even though some of the teachers may not have malintent and may not mean any harm, but it comes it also comes from a lack of a lack of sensitivity. It, it comes from a lack of sensitivity to think it would be good to reenact, do, do reenactments of, 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 of slaves picking cotton, do reenactments of slave auctions. Even though you may not mean any harm, it still comes from a, a lack of sensitivity of that subject matter. But also, once again, this also has to do with the lack of proper training for teachers who have to teach the history of slavery. Um, teaching Tolerance Director Maureen Costello said, uh, nor should teachers gamify painful history, turn painful history into a game like a board game. You, you would never see a board game about Indian massacres, okay, that, that are designed for school, for school children, okay? You, you would never see a board game about Indian massacres. OK, she uh, she cited exercises like having students compete to remove seeds from cotton. These are the types of examples, because when they see one of the things they did was in this for this study, one of the things they did was a survey of seventeen hundred social studies teachers across the country to find out, you know, how do you teach the history of slavery? What are some of your favorite methods? Things like this. Uh, Director Maureen Costello went on to say, quote, often it's done because it's kind of traditional. Maybe they had it when they were in school or they've heard about another teacher who did it and they think this is a great idea. It, it, it gets the kids out of their seats. They'll be active. Now, in one in one example, a 10 year old African-American child was told by a white student, quote unquote, you are my slave in 2017 when a school near Kennesaw Mountain uh, in Georgia invited fifth graders to dress up as characters from the Civil War. You had one white, you had um, uh, one white student tell a 10 year old African American child, you are my slave. Now this is according, this account is according to the uh, black child's parent. The parent's name is Corey Davis, C-O-R-R-I-E. Uh, -R -R now for generations, teachers have wrestled with lessons on discrimination, because none more famously, uh, uh, perhaps none more famously than uh, Jane Elliott, who led a blue eyes, brown eyes exercise in her Riceville, Iowa classroom in response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. So I remember seeing the original videos of that. I think, I think originally the video was black and white, maybe it was color, but I remember seeing the original, um, video of this okay and i've seen interviews she's done roland martin has interviewed her before as well jane elliott you can just google her name jane elliott um blue eye blue eyes brown eyes exercise now jane what jane elliott did was and then she's a white woman okay what she did was she separated her third grade class of white students by eye color and unapologetically treated one group as superior calling them smarter and rewarding them with extra recess and other perks while demeaning the other group. She flipped the roles the following school day, okay? Now she said, Jane Elliott said in the interview, um, she has been through the same backlash as the New York teachers and she stands by her exercise, which she credits with boosting students' academic performance. Jane Elliott said, uh, quote, every student in my classroom 
who went through the exercise performed at a higher level academically than they ever had before because they found out uh, the day they were on the top in that exercise, how really smart they were. Because when she split them up into the groups, one group was elevated and told how smart they were, you can do anything, things like this. The other group was demeaned. And then the next day she flipped it. OK, now Anika Burton, A-N-E-K-A, -E Anika Burton, whose son did not want to be interviewed, OK, by the Associated Press, says she eventually pulled her son Nico out of the school district because of that incident in 2011 uh, when he was 10 years old. When it when it seemed uh, he was being singled out, she pulled him out of the school district when it seemed he was being singled out for discipline and passed over for sports. And she was flooded with hate mail for making the issue public. So she made the issue public. This drew unwanted attention to that school, to the school district. So she's flooded with hate mail. OK, not. Uh, uh, so so I, I find it interesting when people will target someone for speaking up about uh, an injustice like this, but won't target the injustice. They, they, they won't denounce the injustice. They'll, they'll denounce the person who speaks up about the injustice. Once again, the, at the beginning of the story, um, Anika Burton uh, recounted how her 10 year old son named Nico, who's African-American, uh, talked about uh, recounted an experience to his grandfather uh, about what happened to him at school one day. And he said he, he told his grandfather, they made me a slave today. So instead of people uh sending the mail and the discuss to the school district and the school for allowing something like that to happen in the classroom as a as a teaching tool they target the parent who's speaking up about the injustice that happened to her son okay so she pulled her son out of the school district when it seemed he was being singled out for discipline and passed over for sports and she was flooded with hate mail for making the issue public the experience drastically altered his school experience, uh, uh, Anika Burton said. The school principal, uh, the school principal called to apologize. All right. And she said, quote, they were able to touch and feel on the slaves. It was really crazy, she said. Why would you think that's OK to do to a child? And see, once again, I mean, if we if we look at, you know, I did a broadcast uh, about a month or so ago that talked about that dealt with how um, schools are teaching uh, the history of slavery in ways that traumatize our students. And uh, th that particular, uh, it was another article from Vox.com from April 19, 2019. Schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. And it, uh, one of the examples they gave in that article was a recent example that took place in April of 2019. And this dealt with a uh, Arizona mother who posted on Facebook that her African-American son, who uh, at the time was a nine year old in third grade, had participated in a classroom simulation in which he had to, quote, walk through his class as his teachers and fellow students yelled at yelled at, humiliated, and berated him during a lesson on school segregation, end quote. Now, this was reported by the uh, Arizona Republic. And this was a, a reenactment of the integration of Central High School by the Little Rock Nine, okay, uh, post Brown versus Board of Education. The incident took place in early April 2019 at BASIS, B-A-S-I-S, -S, BASIS, Phoenix Central, a charter school for students in kindergarten through fifth grade. The Arizona Republic reports that the simulation was meant to reenact the moment when the Little Rock Nine, a group of uh, nine African-American high school students integrated Arkansas's um, Little Rock Central High School, Arkansas's Little Rock Central High School. All right. Now, in this re in this reenactment, the, the, the students were yelling at uh, at the student but they were not allowed to use racial slurs or vulgarity. OK, and the the the, uh, the parent talked about how that experience 
traumatized her child. The boy's mother, uh, Claudia Rodriguez, explained in an April 12th Facebook post that she found that she only found out about the reenactment after another parent told her about it. Claudia Rodriguez added that when she told the school that putting her son in that position was offensive and hurtful, educators reportedly told her that, quote, there was some educational value in this incident because it started conversations in the homes of the other kids, end quote. Yeah, but it's at his expense. See, once again, this is this is another example. OK, and this this things like this keep happening. So this is why uh, parents have to organize, take these studies into the schools. Take these to the parent, take these studies into the schools, take them to the school board meetings. All right. And if they if, if the principals read it, if the school district will read this, they would realize that we have to we have to change this. Because it's telling you, it tells you in the study what not to do. The other thing that the study did is that it uh, did a survey of 1,000 high school seniors, 12th graders, did a survey of 1,000 high school seniors. And it found that uh, out of 1,000 high school seniors, only 8% knew that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. Okay. Out of 1,000 high school seniors, it found that uh, only 8% knew that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. And then it found that 68% uh, did not know that it took a constitutional amendment to formally end slavery, the 13th Amendment. They thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation did not free the enslaved Africans. OK, so when, when you have studies like this and you have students that do poorly on the studies, th these are 12th graders. What it shows is one, the parents didn't teach them this information, and two, the schools did not teach them this information. All right, so uh, post your comments, questions here. We'll try to get some of those in. Uh, so check out check out this article from uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com. Other outlets picked it up. Detroit News picked it up. It's uh, originally from the Associated Press. It's entitled "Schools Still Struggling with How to Teach About Slavery." Schools still strug struggling with how to teach about slavery. And this is one of the reasons why um, this information is so important. Also, to teach in the homes as well. OK, and we cover a lot of this information in the online course that I teach. Also, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. If you need me to post a link uh, for the online course so you can register for it, let me know. We'll do that. It's an eight. It's a uh, eight week, 16 hour online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. And we try to deal with this, uh, deal with the history chronologically as well, because historical events don't happen in a vacuum. Um, this we have to understand the a sequence of historical events that lead up to another, a larger event taking place. OK, I'll show you some of the uh, information we cover because I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have articles, book references. Um, so we teach it Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to continue dealing with some of the history of the Moors as well. Um, I had so much information that I did not get all of it in the, the class. I did a special class this past Friday. So we have to continue. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll continue tonight. And then one of the things that, that I'm dealing with are some uh, articles in the past few years that also deal with some of the history of the Moors as well. But in the article, um, I made a note here to talk about this in the article from uh, blackamericaweb.com. School still struggling with how to teach about slavery. Um, it talks about every student in my class who went through that exercise performed at a higher level academically than they ever had before because they found out uh, the day they, they found out the day they were on the top in that exercise how really smart they were that's jane elliott right so then this causes you to have to ask the question well what is the negative consequence of african americans calling themselves the n-word day in and day out what's the negative consequence of us uh, african americans being attacked and dehumanized and vilified in a lot of our music by negative corporate control hip-hop music I'm not against hip hop. I'm against negative corporate control hip hop being used against us. 
What 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 is the consequence when our women are called the B word and H word and thoughts and all types of derogatory things? How does that program you? OK, to because it can't boost your self-esteem. When, when, when you when, when you are steadily inundated with negative images that show the hypersexualization of African-American women that uh, focuses on their body parts, that uh, dehumanizes them and focuses on their body as opposed to the mind. A lot of a lot of the same things with African-American men. When you uh, have a lot of music that focuses on drugs, promiscuity, criminality, you, then you have to ask the question, what is the negative consequence of this music being targeted to African-Americans, especially our youth? Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. What's the negative consequence of that? If in this, if, if in this study that she did, and this study was largely with white students, OK, that Jane Elliott did. And, and you can go online and the, the YouTube video should be there. You can see interviews with her. She Jane Elliott separated her third grade class of white students by eye color and unapologetically treated one group as superior, calling them smarter and rewarding them with extra recess and other perks while demeaning the other group. Well, what happens when we are demeaned in our music? What happens when there are images? of African-Americans that we see constantly that dehumanizes us and demean us. It, 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 it starts to take a toll because other people see those images as well. And it programs them on how to think about, react to, how to treat a targeted group of people. So, and when, when you're not properly taught the history of slavery in this country, and how slavery maldistributed wealth, power, and resources, okay, uh, into in, 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 into the hands of, of white society at the expense of African Americans. I mean, re read the article from Tana Hesse Coates, a 17 page article from Tana Hesse Coates called The Case for Reparations. He did his research, I can tell. Okay, I, I, I read this, I, I read the article when it came out. This was in the June 2014 issue of The Atlantic. And what he did was he connected the legacy of slavery to policies uh, like uh, redlining created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933, which is part of the New Deal, President Roosevelt. OK, uh, housing discrimination, things like this. He talked about in uh, he, he talked about the GI Bill, the discrimination when it came to the GI Bill and how the resources of the GI Bill, the 67 billion dollars uh, that were invested into the GI Bill to give low interest loans, to go to college, to buy houses and to start businesses, how this was totally maldistributed uh, towards white GIs and 1.2 million African-American GIs who served in World War II were largely discriminated against from uh, taking advantage of that, uh, of those programs and how and how the GI Bill is one of the main um, uh, policies to, that widen the wealth gap. And the GI Bill totally changed the landscape of, of, of higher education in this country as well. OK, that that is a policy that was uh, signed in the law in 1944 by President Roosevelt. OK. Uh, somebody asked a question. I may be wrong, but I thought the Civil War was about the South wanting to leave the United States. This, the South seceded from the Union, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, because th they thought that Lincoln was going to free the slaves and they wanted to maintain slavery because slavery was essential. It was central to them maintaining their wealth and their way of life. And these in these these southern states stated this in their statements of secession. They, they talked about this in their statements of secession, how slavery was central to their way of life. Read the read the article from the Atlantic.com called Why There Was a Civil War, Why There Was a Civil War. OK. He wanted he wanted to free uh, Lincoln. The Emancipation Proclamation was a military strategy first issued uh, September 22nd, 1863 as a threat to uh, bring the South back into the Union. And it stated that if the states in rebellion, the territories in rebellion did not come back into the Union by January 1st, 1863, that their slaves would be free. 
this was this was a military strategy. Malcolm X talked about how Lincoln used freeing the slaves as a political football. This was this is what this was about. The Civil War was not fought to free the slaves. The Civil War was fought to bring the South back into the Union. And, and that's what Lincoln wanted to do. He wanted to keep the Union together at all costs. Then when they did not come back and then when those uh, states in rebellion did not come back into the Union. OK, then he issued the what we know is the real Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. But it did not apply to the border states like Maryland, Kentucky, Delaware and Missouri. They were still those states still maintain slaves, but they stayed loyal to the Union. So they were allowed to keep their slaves. There's about one million slaves uh, still in the Union. OK, in those border states. So they were allowed to keep their, their enslaved Africans because uh, they stayed loyal to the Union. All right. Let's see who we have here. OK, so we have Celeste. We have. Um, who else? Q. OK, so um, we'll post a link here. You register for our online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understand, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is some of the type of information that uh, we deal with in the class. We get deep into it. All the uh, So we do the class live. All of the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch them over and over again, watch them on demand. Uh, we deal with thousands of years of history. There's about 36 hours of bonus content. Uh, you can watch from around the world. So it's, uh, it's on sale, $80, regularly $130. And uh, it's a eight week, 14 hour, uh, eight week, 16 hour online course. You may go a little over 16 hours. I'm just telling you right now, because I have a lot of information. And um, we do class number four at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. OK, so we do class number four tonight. All right. Right. And then I asked the question, why are negative terms used? Uh, the most for African Americans also, uh, because see, when you look at other people's music, right? Other people's music don't have usually racial epithets. Uh, their music is not laced with racial epithets attacking them. Their music is more likely to uplift them. Now I know there's some music that uplifts, but if we look at negative corporate control hip hop, you will find that largely it does not uplift, largely attacks. And, and, and is targeting African-American youth. And the reason why it, tar it targets African-American youth, one, is because they're the least likely to have the defenses to fight against it. Two, th that's how you go after pu people's future. You attack their youth. That's how you arrest a people's future. You attack their youth. If you want to destroy a nation, you do it through the music because the music hits the youth first. So many of us don't understand how we're being attacked by the music, how we're being attacked by the lyrics. And whatever is disseminated becomes imitated. Whatever is disseminated becomes imitated. OK, so uh, check out these articles here. We'll post some uh, some links for, for some more as well. And uh, read the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center also teaching hard history. American slavery. It's a, it's a really good study. Uh, Dr. Kwame Hassan Jeffries, uh, nephew of Dr. Leonard Jeffries, he was um, on the committee that put this together as well. And he talks about, you know, I've seen a number of articles dealing with this. He talks about uh, how teaching the uh, history of slavery is hard. Anyway, it is, it is hard. Okay. And you don't want you want to teach it in a way where you're sensitive to um, different ethnic groups in the uh, class. And it has to be age appropriate the way you teach it. Also, let me see. There was let me see, there was an article that quoted uh, Dr. Kwame Hassan Jeffries. I just saw his uncle, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, one of my teachers, saw him at the Encobra conference uh, here in Detroit uh, in June of 2019. Let's see here. Uh, let me let me do this also. Let's bring up the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I told you I'll give you a quick preview here. Let's look at this. Uh, here's some of the things that we cover in the online course also. And I'll pull up this quote 
from uh, Dr. Kwame Hassan Jeffries. Let's go to this here. Let's bring this up just a second. So I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, book references. Uh, it's about 50 articles that we cover in the class also. All right. Let me go to the slide I wanted. So one of the things that's important for us to understand, right, is that uh, so this year, August 20th, 16, 19. OK, uh, this year is the year of return. Uh, a lot of African-Americans, I was just looking at some information about a trip back to Ghana. Um, so we see that this year is the year of return commemorating August 20th, 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, when that group of 20 and odd Africans came into Port Comfort on the uh, White Lion slave ship. Well, even though that did happen, African people have been in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. And this is something that a lot of people uh, don't know. So if you have seen any of my interviews with the Dr. David M. Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, uh, you know this. Or if, you, if you've seen interviews or heard any interviews I've done with him, I've done, uh, I think, 11 interviews with him, I think it was. And this book came out in 2011. And this is one of the sources we use in the online course. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along with. Uh, to be able to follow along in the course. Uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, okay? And in his book, he deals with uh, 13, it was, his book has 713 footnotes. He deals with uh, 13 different, um, 13 different types of evidence that were found in Allendale, Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, footprints and lava, genetic M174 D haploid groups, dealing with DNA and genetics. They found uh, 13 different disciplines thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, this is before Native Americans came into existence, okay? For those that may be uh, confused, this is before Native Americans came into existence. And here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. Uh, this is an article, article from sciencedaily.com. And the name of the article was, uh, New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago, okay? New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And this is from November 8th, 2004. This is about his discovery, okay? And here's a summary of the discovery. You can read this article in its entirety. Here's a summary of the, of the discovery. It says, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May in the Savannah River uh, in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archeologist, Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay. So this is dealing with the Khoisan. The Khoisan come from Southern Africa. They have the uh, oldest DNA on the planet. Uh, they go, they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world and they were here in this land as well. That we call the United States of America. They build pyramid mounds. Uh, there are about a, a, a million mounds in this land. Today, they're only about 100,000, but there were pyramid mounds up and down the Mississippi River, okay, as well. One of the lo largest mounds that still exists is called Cahokia in um, East Illinois, Cahokia. So it, we deal with a lot of this history. We, we, we connect the ancient. Uh, the Africans know as the Moors to ancient Egypt. They're taking the teachings from ancient Egypt into Europe. And this brings you up out of the Dark Ages. Um, one of the things I, I talk about is Queen Charlotte Sophia, because she was of uh, African Moors ancestry on her mother's side. She was the wife of King George III. And this is the king that the 13 colonies are fighting against uh, and declaring independence against when they, we have the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. 
Uh, most of them didn't sign. Most of the 56 signs of the Declaration of Independence, 52 did not sign until August 2nd, 1776. OK, but she was of African ancestry. And this is one of the famous paintings of uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia. There was a recent book that came out uh, about her. Roland Martin interviewed the uh, author of the book when he still had his show uh, on TV One News One Now with Roland Martin. But this is a famous painting of Queen Charlotte Sophia but done by Sir Alan Ramsey's. Uh, it was done in 1762. OK. And the and it, it's um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. The this, that's where the painting help, uh, is held in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Charlotte, North Carolina was named after Queen Charlotte Sophia. All right. What happened was over time, the paintings of her got lighter and lighter in complexion okay to hide her afrocoid features this is what happened okay so there are examples that we see of the history of the moors when, when, when it comes to paintings um literature things like that okay those are some of the things we'll talk about in the class we'll continue uh from last week because we ran out of time. I have so much information. We ran out of time, but we did two hours and I didn't want to overwhelm people. All right. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with some of that. And then, uh, you know, we deal with things like uh, why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? This all ties into the Black Madonna and Child, etc. But I want to give uh, a quick uh, overview. Where is that? Uh, um, let me see. It may not be in this one. May have to pull up the other one give you a quick overview of uh, some of the content. How's everybody doing? If you have any questions, uh, post your questions here for me. We'll be here for a few more minutes. Uh, Q, have not heard about Dr. David M. Hotep. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Dr. David M. Hotep, man, is deep. His new book should be out now. I need to check with him. I talked to him about two months ago. He was finishing up his new book, um, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And it has about 200 additional pages. I, I gave him a call, um, gave him a call recently, and uh, I need to follow up with him because it's been hectic. All right, let's look at this one here. Yeah, this is this, this is the one I have it in. All right, let's close this one. All right, just a minute here. Let's bring this up. How you all like this type of information? Where is it? All right, let's bring this up here. Okay. One of the things also we talk about is the movie Black Panther, because Black Panther is a very, very deep movie. It helps uh, reconnect uh, African people to African history and culture. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand the movie and haven't really done research. It, even people who I've heard talk about it, they haven't really done research on it. I mean, I had to I did research for months. I read over 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther, in addition to seeing the film twice. I read a book dealing with the 52 year history of the Black Panther movie. I watched numerous articles. I read, I watched numerous interviews with the cast members, director Ryan Coogler, things like this. So I did like deep, deep research to be able to um, do my lectures because I do lectures on the film Black Panther. And uh, we'll talk about that some here in the course because the film Black Panther also ties in the language. The language spoken in the film is the Isi Kosa language. Isi Kosa is spoken, spoken in Southern Africa. It's a Bantu language. It's spoken in Southern Africa. It's spoken as far as uh, as far west as Cameroon. It's spoken in East Africa as well. And uh, in the uh, Bantu in in, in Isi Kosa, you have some of the some of the click sounds. Okay. Some of the click sounds and, and the click language was the was the first language and the click language is spoken by the Khoisan. So all this history ties together as well. 
in the world wakanda is a real world even though wakanda is a fictitious place wakanda is uh still a real world a, a real word wakanda is a uh a bantu word but we see the word wakanda in native american languages like the omaha panka language the sioux indian language uh wakanda means possesses secret powers so i saw an article today of um uh hip-hop mogul um master p talking about the film black panther didn't benefit african-americans i'm like people should really do research before they put out information like that number one uh a lot of the film black panther was filmed at tyler perry studios in atlanta which means they paid him last time i checked tyler perry was black the film um pumped about 89 million dollars into the georgia economy and they hired 3,000 people there in georgia in, in involving the film everything from extras to hairdressers limousine services all different types of things like this caterers some of those people were african-americans this was reported by deadline.com i told you i did a lot of research dealing with the film um you had a number of different african-american businesses that made a lot of money blackenterprise.com had articles about this atlanta journal constitution had articles um african-american bookstores um also stores that sold african clothing because a lot of african-americans were buying african clothing african garb to go to the premiere of the movie so i saw numerous articles where african-american owned clothing stores they did sell african garb things like this they were talking about how they saw a huge surge in sales and this was the film debuted february 8 uh february 16th i think it was february 16th 2018 in african-american history month which was strategic now my degrees in business administration with a major in marketing that's a stroke of genius to do that and it and it, and it greatly benefited african-american businesses but here's the here's what people don't seem to understand right you had to be positioned to be able to take advantage of the opportunity and that's what a lot of people were not positioned to do see success is where preparation meets opportunity well you knew for four years that the movie was coming out and we knew in 2016 in captain america civil war that the movie was coming out in 2018 so how did you position yourself to take advantage of the opportunity there were ads that ran on tv one that's african-american owned which means they made money off of those ads there were ads that were on the home page of news1.com which means they made money at revenue uh, uh ad revenue uh coming from whoever the marketing company was the advertising company that placed the ads for that there was there were ads on thegrio.com which is african-american owned, owned by byron allen okay so i can take you step by step by step and show you how with master p even though i like master p i like watching him on uh growing up hip-hop right but that's that's totally false but you have to have like really done research to understand this and if people if black people did like dr boyce Watkins said and bought some stock in disney well when that stock went up when the movie came out you made money also even if you didn't go see the movie but success is where preparation meets opportunities so, see i taught entrepreneurship for seven years also success is where preparation meets opportunity so how did you position yourself for success you knew the movie was coming out all all the all the black panther uh t-shirts that i have and i have like five of them different designs different black panther t-shirts i bought from african-american vendors i can i can show you african-american vendors that made a lot of money off of black panther uh paraphernalia the the poster behind me that cost ten dollars i bought from an african-american vendor so I can show you step by step. There were, there, were, there, there, there were African Americans across the country that rented out movie theaters and held premieres of the movie, charged money for it, made money from that as well, sold out premieres. Maya Crown Williams is one of them who did it here in Detroit. Success is where preparation meets opportunity. So how did you prepare yourself for success? Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Somebody said they made up their own accents. The 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 language is uh, called Isikosa. So before you make a statement like that, you really need to Google Isikosa Black Panther and do some research because that means you haven't done any research. Making up an accent and actually not having and actually having a fake language are two different things. 
So you should really go do some research because I've already, I've already, I've already done mine. I can prove what I'm saying. They it, actually, if you saw the story from ABC World News tonight, they talked about it and interviewed the cast members, and they talked about the language Isi Kosa. And John Kanai, who plays T'Challa's father, he's South African. He speaks Isi Kosa, and he was the one who got the the language interjected into the movie. But once again, this is what happens when you don't do research. Okay. Uh, so research John Kanai. All right, so let's go back to uh, the slide. So here's some of the things that we deal with in the uh, online course. What was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play in the transatlantic slave trade? Because he's he's central to the spread of it. He didn't start the transatlantic slave trade. Oh, but he's central to the spread of it. Then you got to deal with uh, Right Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, who went along with Columbus on some of his voyages, and then also uh, King Charles V and the Asiento uh, of 1517 as well. All these things cause the, these papal bulls and, and things like this cause the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, when did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Because it was even before August 20, 1619, because the Spanish had taken Africans into the territory we call South Carolina in the 1520s. This is this is about 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. See, people don't talk about that. They talk about August 20, 1619. This is when we first came to this land or first came to these shores. They don't even talk about the Spanish. The Spanish were involved in the transatlantic slave trade before the English. Were African people in America before uh, the slave trade? Uh, yes, we were. This was our land stolen from us. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. The 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, crucial because all this stuff gets flipped around during that period of time in Europe. All this stuff gets flipped around. And I've said before, I wish we never taught them because everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind. Uh, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. And I mean, these discoveries are coming out every other month. And when these discoveries happen, the scientists, archaeologists, paleontologists, et cetera, you know, they say we have to rethink everything. We have to look for uh, uh, life. We have to look for uh, remains of homo sapiens, modern man and places we never thought to look before. We have to push back the dates. We have to push back the timelines, all the stuff. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. This is what we're dealing with. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. And with more of these archaeological discoveries coming out, it is harder and harder for them to suppress the evidence of this African presence going back tens of thousands of years ago. What, what happens to the psyche of African-Americans who are inundated with negative corporate control hip hop and we're taught that African-American women are B's and H's and thoughts and things like this. And African-American men are N words. What happens when we understand that this was our land stolen from us and we were in this land? I'm not saying this world. Yes, this land that we call the United States of America. We were here before anybody else. We're not guessing this land. We did not first come to this land conquered by European shackled and chains. That, that happens thousands of years later after things get twisted around in Europe. What what happens to the psyche of African-American children when when they find out that Christopher Columbus not only did not discover America, but never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. This is why I show you where he went on his four voyages. Not only did he not discover America, he never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The whole the, the way the whole history is taught is backwards. We deal with insurance companies that took out insurance policies on not just slave ships, but enslaved Africans on the plantations. One of them started out in the spring of 1845 called the Nautilus Mutual Life Insurance Company. Today is known as the New York Life Insurance Company. To their credit, they are pretty much upfront with that history and, and talk about it and teach about it. Others, not so much. And some don't exist. There were over 40 insurance companies in this country that sold insurance policies on enslaved Africans on the plantation. 
You talk about Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, uh, the origins of the term America and Africa. Uh, we also deal with the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 because Willie Lynch never historically existed. I, I don't know why people still talk about Willie Lynch. I mean, you might as well be talking about Santa Claus bringing you a BMW and a Mercedes Benz Christmas Day. Uh, the problem with slave movies, while we're being bombarded with slave movies and the slave thing, TV show Underground is not on anymore. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm happy about that um, because... It, you know that when we see they like to put out movies that show us as slaves they like to put out movies that show us as slaves you know i, I did when the movie the help came out back i think it was like 2012 something like that i did a radio show um called it's the help helping us and i talked about how a lot of the movies that we are in that get critical acclaim and win the Oscars and things like this, you're either a slave, a servant, or a stereotype. A slave, a servant, or a stereotype. The help won Oscars, okay? Um, Lupita Nyong'o won for, I think she won for 12 Years a Slave. I mean, she, I'm not taking anything away from her acting ability. I'm, I'm talking about how Hollywood works. You're either a slave, a servant, or a stereotype. We saw Denzel Washington won for Training Day. We saw Halle Berry won for um, Monsters Ball. We saw uh, Monique won for Precious, playing a horrible, horrible mother. Precious was just a debacle of a movie. You know, um, my friend Tony Tony Browder has a good uh, lecture dealing with that called uh, Blind, Blindsided from Precious to Monsters Ball, something like that. Uh, we see that three six mafia one uh for the song is hard out here for a pimp for hustle and flow when you go through and look i'm not saying it every time but majority of the time when african-americans win for their their roles in movies um they're either playing a slave a servant or a stereotype we can go back to 1939 when hattie hattie uh mcdaniels Winning Best Supporting Actress for Gone with the Wind. She was playing a slave. So we see a pattern, okay? So when I see a TV show like Underground, um, I know you got some people that had good intentions, John Legend, things like that, but it, no. They like showing, they like depicting us as slaves, being hunted, okay? Uh, Asara Arset and Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story, uh, links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, etc. Okay, those are some of the few things we deal with. Okay, all right, let's see here. So, we'll post a link here. You can register for the online course. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, the first um, three classes, and there's about 36 hours of bonus content as well. You can watch from around the world and uh, we do the classes live but they're all recorded also so you can go back and watch them if you miss any of them I understand people have to work or can't tune in all right so uh, we posted it there we'll post it here on um, YouTube as well and it's also at our website africanhistorynetwork.com african africanhistorynetwork.com america is a continent uh america became the united states of america which is a corporation okay so all right you're dealing with the corporation and uh you deal with black's law dictionary and the 14th amendment because the 14th amendment uh the five clauses of the 14th amendment the 14th amendment through corporate person corporate personhood through corporate personhood and legal fiction uh gave um all the rights of human beings to corporations. So if you look at a legal dictionary, um, it tells you that a person, P-E-R-S-O-N, a person is a human being or a business or a corporation, okay? And that's based upon, um, the, it's based upon the 14th Amendment, but also based upon some legal cases as well. And there was, a, there was actually a case from the 2000s, I think it was, where um, 
Nike. Uh, there was a case where Nike argued that they had to, the right to lie when it came to some type of promotion because they had all the rights of a person, a human being. All right. Uh, people are defined as corporations. Well, a person is defined as a corporation, not people. The legal definition for people and a legal definition for person are different. OK, if you look in the legal dictionary, it does not tell you people are a corporation. It tells you a person. There's a difference between the two. People referring to the human being flesh and blood person can refer to a human being or it can refer to a corporation. It's not people. There's a difference. When when Mitt Romney back in about 2012 or so said people are corporations, he was close. It's a person is a corporation. There's a difference. All right. I don't just study history. OK, guys, look, we got to get out of here. I have to teach this class. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.